So this is a video essay about the 1965 Lewis Pinwell film Simon of the Desert, but it's kind of also not a video essay about the 1965 Lewis Pinwell film Simon of the Desert, but let's try this. I first saw Simon of the Desert in 1993 at what I'm going to describe as a bit of a low point for me. I wasn't doing terribly well, I was spiralling in many ways. If you had met me in 1993, if we'd shaken hands and you'd looked into my eyes, you would have noticed absolutely nothing at all, which is, I think, often the way in these kind of situations. In 1993, it felt like there was a background of kind of religious themed media going on as well. So there was uh, Last Temptation of Christ, there was The Name of the Rose, there was Little Buddha, a British TV show called Cad Fail as well. So watching monks and religious stuff on TV in 1993 didn't feel that weird. Simon of the Desert is a, it's a 45 minute film, a short film because they ran out of money. It's a film about an ascete or an ascetic of Simon, played by Claudio Brook, who stands on a pillar, uh, just meets a lot of people. Lots of people come to see him and he kind of interacts with them. He disapproves of a lot of things that they do. Simon is standing on a column because he has forsaken his physical form. He wants an end to it all. He just wants to commune with God. He's promising himself to God and he's kind of, he's looking forward to the day that he's rid of his body. But the main crux of the film is that the devil, played by Sylvia Pennell, who was the wife of the producer, Gustavo Aladris, keeps visiting Simon to try and get him to come off his column, to feel the ground under his feet and to gorge himself on earthly pleasures. So he wants to stay on the column. The devil wants him to get off the column. The devil appears in a number of different guises. She appears as a woman with a picture, as an innocent child. She appears as a shepherd. She also turns up at the end of the film in a coffin. So you have this kind of broadly comic film. Simon is very pious and very sincere. The fun is kind of made of his attitude to life. At the same time, Bunuel was very sincere in the character of Simon as well. He really believed in this guy. He really liked where he was coming from. Anyway, so I was watching this film. I can't really explain the positive impact it had on me, but it was remarkable. And then there was this scene in particular. Siempre los hombres se desgarrarán en luchas fratricidas. Y todo por esa maldición de lo tuyo y lo mío. ¿De qué hablas? De que el hombre mata por defender lo que cree suyo. No entiendo qué es lo tuyo, qué es lo mío. That might look like nothing, but what was important to me was the fact that when I saw Simon of the Desert, I was kind of entertaining ideas on how to live a good life and how to be a good person. And I was entertaining ideas which Simon of the Desert then started showing me. So 1993, I was feeling quite alone. I was cutting myself off from people a little bit. I was just spinning ideas around in my head, just not really in a good place. Watching Simon of the Desert, it felt like I was not alone. It felt like the ideas I was entertaining were being acknowledged somewhere else. I had a similar thing years later reading a Maupassant book on a plane and thinking, my god, this is my life right now. But since then, I've kind of noticed a lot of things collapse together, not just for me, but also I think maybe for Boonwell and also other people. And that's kind of what I like to talk about here. In order to do that, we have to look at Boonwell's life a little bit. Boonwell was born in Calanda in Spain in the year 1900. He made friends with Salvador Dali and Federico Garcia Lorca and the three of them all moved to Paris together to become students. In Paris, Bunuel and Dali become part of the Surrealist movement and they make their first short film, Un Chien Andalou, in 1929. Around the same time, Federico Garcia Lorca reads a book that he likes and he recommends it to Bunuel and it's called The Golden Legend. And The Golden Legend contains a chapter about Simon Stylite and Bunuel and Lorca have long conversations about this chapter and Bunuel talked about how he would love to make a film about this Simon Stylite character this column in the middle of the desert. So Bunuel and Dali make Un Chien Andalou, and the film is a huge success. Bunuel is then funded to make a sound feature film called Large Door. Large Door is met with hostility. There is a riot, it is banned for a long time. So to our eyes now, Un Chien Andalou is quite clearly controversial. Large Door was equally upsetting for a lot of people back then. Um, it features random acts of violence as comedy, which, you know, this is the work of a young man perhaps. It also features the character of Christ, reimagining him as a character from the Marquis de Sade's Salo, leaving an orgy. People hated it. Boonwell has this surrealist period. He then becomes kind of persona non grata and he can't get any filmmaking work. Also, Lorca dies in 1936. Remember, this is Boonwell's great friend, Federico Garcia Lorca. He is killed in the Spanish Civil War. Boonwell then enters what is called the wilderness years. He can't get any work. He's got a young family. He travels from France to America. He's doing odd bits of film work for 
like Warner Brothers and other people. He wants to get a film made, he just can't get anything done. Dali then writes a book in which he outs Boonwell as a Marxist. Talks a lot of smack about Boonwell in this book. And Boonwell is then blacklisted from employment in North America. So he then has to move to Mexico. And opportunities arise for him to start directing films again. And in 1947, he directs Grand Casino. And then in 1950, he directs Los Olvidados, which is kind of the door opening again for filmmaking opportunities. Because Los Olvidados does terribly well. People love that film. His career is then able to continue. He continues he's making films in Mexico. He's making films to a brief in Mexico, so he's doing kind of melodramas, dramas. He has, you know, he has to get money. He has to get bums on seats. He has to get people in to watch the film. So he has to use stars. He has to use stories, which perhaps he didn't want. But he is injecting his own kind of surrealist sensibilities into these films. In 1965, he makes Summer in the Desert with Gustavo Alatrist. It is his last Mexican film. And after this, he will move to France. If you've seen a Bunuel film before, it's likely that you've seen something from a surrealist period or something from his late to colour French period with Silverman, little in between. So things collapsing in on themselves. In 1965, Bunuel makes Simon of the Desert. Bunuel is going deaf at this point and he's kind of moved against having non-diegetic music in his films. But there is non-diegetic music in the film and it's this. <laughs> What you're listening to are the drums of Kalanda. Remember, Boonwell was born in Kalanda. There is a festival there every year. People just play the drums over and over and over again for days and days and days. They do it until their hands bleed. The drums of Kalanda had a really big influence on Boonwell. He used them twice in his film, in Simon of the Desert, and he used them in Large Lourdes. If you're using something like Drums of Kalanda, you might expect to use it for something exciting. In Simon of the Desert, that's not what happens because it just gets used to illustrate Simon's mother walking past a column carrying a bundle of sticks, and then also Simon eating some lettuce and feeding half a leaf to a rabbit. In Large Door, you get far more what you would expect when someone uses drums. You get that energy from this scene. In Ancient Andalou, there's a the famous scene where a man is licking his hand and it's filled with ants. Dali then writes that book about Brunel, trash talking him and kind of ruining his career, making his life terribly difficult. In 1965, when Brunel makes Simon of the Desert, he chooses to have this shot. Now, although Bunuel was very against interpretation, he said that everything in his films didn't mean anything, but it's difficult not to look at this moment and think this is Bunuel putting an end to his relationship with Dali, getting rid of those ants. Also, let's consider the fact that it's 1965 and Bunuel, a 65-year-old man, is making a film based on a chapter from a book that was recommended to him by his good friend who died in 1936. It's almost 30 years of no Lorca. We all have people who are no longer with us anymore but we kind of carry them around with us. It feels like Bunuel is doing this. Another way of thinking about it is that Bunuel is one human being living one life and the events of that life will appear in different films in different ways. Cut to 2016, the summertime. Me watching The Passion of Anna by Ingmar Bergman for the first time. The impact that The Passion of Anna had on me was that I felt revealed. There are four characters in the film. It's about this guy Andreas who lives on an island. He meets Anna. He meets the neighbours, they all kind of become buds. What astonished me about The Passion of Anna was that I saw myself in every character in the film. We often see ourselves in characters in films, but the characters said things that I had said in my life. They did things that I have done. They thought dark thoughts that I have thought. It was very, very unsettling. Watching Simon of the Desert in 1993, I had that feeling of not being alone in the world. Watching The Passion of Anna in 2016, I felt revealed. I felt like it felt like my head was made of glass and my thoughts were being projected for everyone to see. Also, things collapsing together. In Large Door, Bunuel was showing us random acts of violence for comedy. In The Passion of Anna, Bergman is showing us random acts of violence as a lack of faith in humanity. Bergman, by 1969, has kind of, he's lost faith in people. He sees violence as random and meaningless and able to happen at any moment. Bunuel, when he talks about violence, Bunuel actually, if you read Bunuel, Bunuel's autobiography, My Last Breath, My Last Sigh, whatever you want to call it, he also talks about how random acts of violence can happen at any point. Bergman and Bunuel are kind of collapsing together here. Also, funds. 1998. The actor Vincent Gallo makes a film called Buffalo 66, and in that film he asks a question, which is, how do you film four people round a table? And Vincent Gallo did it like this. You want something to drink, honey? Of course. 
Gary, could you make me a rum and coke? What, honey? I meant, uh, can I have a ginger ale? Oh, well, sure, we got a ginger ale. Hold on. What's really interesting here is that Vincent Gallo will remove a person from the table as the camera kind of moves around. Not only will he remove a person, but he'll also remove all the objects of that person. So you'll notice that Billy's glass, which is in front of him here, when we cut to Billy's POV around the table, that glass is gone. And it's just a kind of a really interesting idea. Cinema as a kind of a playground for playing with ideas on how do you do things. In 1969, when Ingmar Bergman had the same question, how do you film four people around a table, he did this. All kind of fascinating things. In 1984, Alex Cox makes Repo Man, and the character of Miller says this. Suppose you're thinking about a plate of shrimp. Suddenly somebody will say like, plate, or shrimp, or plate of shrimp, out of the blue, no explanation. No point in looking for one either. It's all part of a cosmic unconsciousness. Now you might think this is all nothing more than the lattice of coincidence, but I would encourage you to entertain the possibility that there's a kind of a human connection going on here, that the, the thoughts of all these different people over all these different time periods are kind of coming together because there is one thing at the center of it, which is us and being human, living a life, making decisions and thinking about things. So yeah, that's kind of what I learned from Simon the Desert. I kind of got two lessons from it. Number one, it came to me at a crucial time. The film appeared like a kind of a ray of light through the darkness at the time when things were not great for me. I felt less alone in the universe, which was, you know, who doesn't want that? Also, as my life has gone on, it has been part of a series of sticks which have kind of fallen together. 1993 falls into 1998, which falls into 2016. The decisions of Vincent Gallo fall into the decisions of Ingmar Bergman fall into the decisions of Louis Buñuel. Perhaps one way of looking at this is that if you're open to seeing these things, if you're open to letting a film kind of come into your life and touch you in ways that might be positive and in ways which might make you feel vulnerable, I would applaud this.